Good morning, everyone. My name is Michaela Pauchner, and I'm Managing Editor at No-Till Farmer. Thank you for joining us for today's digital demonstration with Indigo, Microbials, the X Factor for your corn. Today's presenters are Jim Sink, Indigo's Director of Biological Product Marketing, Pierre Morris, a seasoned agronomist and technical service manager for Indigo, and Al Green, Indigo's Senior Product Development and Enablement Manager. They're going to dive deep into how Indigo's biologicals are boosting crops to start strong, stay strong, and end stronger. Before they get started with the presentation, I have just a couple of housekeeping items. On your screen, there is a control panel with a Q&A icon. You can submit questions here at any time during the presentation, and we'll take those at the end of the presentation. You can also click to raise your hand, in which I will unmute you, and then you can ask your question in person. Again, we'll take those questions at the end of the presentation. We're also recording today's session in the event you want to go back and watch it or share it with anyone. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jim Sink, who's going to get started talking about Indigo's Biotrinsic M33 FP and M34 FP product. Now I know we're gonna focus on three products, but we have an entire product line and it's really depending on the crop, depending on the stress factor, uh, but we have product for drought tolerance, heat tolerance, nutrient use efficiency and disease management. Now, the unique thing about the product line is that they're plant-derived microbial products that empower natural physiological and biochemical processes in the plant. So in other words, they work with the plant and the plant root ecosystem. They help guard against abiotic and biotic stresses. What does that mean? Abiotic being the environmental stresses of heat, drought, and biotic stresses, diseases, and uh, other biological stress. It helps improve the health and vigor of the plant throughout the growing season to help increase yield performance. Now the product we're gonna talk specifically about this morning, Biotrinsic X19, W12, and M33, M34, all three are flowable powder products. Uh, so they can be applied on farm in the field at the time of planting. They can apply, apply the header schedule. Uh, they can be even applied by the seed uh, dealer that you get your seed from. The active ingredients, uh, I won't go into the Latin names, but just to let you know, we have a combination of a single actives and then products like W12, M33, M34, which are a combination of microbes. And those bring those unique strengths together to help improve the plant health and vigor. All of them are applied at a rate of one volume uh, ounce per hundred weight. And they have a good shelf life. I do want to talk about on seed stability because that's one thing that a lot of people talk about and are concerned with. You know, just how stable are they? Once they're applied to the seed, do I have to plant right away? Well, you you don't have to. I mean, there's a window of once you apply of 60 days for X19, 45 for W12, and 60 for M33, M34, which means that whether you apply it in the planter, you apply it in the seed tender, wherever you apply it, you have a window. Of, in which you can then go out and plant. So if something happens, you get rain, uh, life gets in the way, don't worry, the microbes are gonna be viable, they're gonna be strong, and they give you that window, that flexibility to plant when you need to. When it comes to how compatible are they with other seed treatments? Again, we've yet to identify any that have caused a problem, and we've tested most of the major uh, seed treatments uh, for corn and soy. So again, it's added to existing treatments. It's you choose how to apply it, where to apply it. It's very flexible, all three products. Well, I'll focus a little bit right now on uh, X19, again, a new biofungicide. What's really exciting about this is it has multiple modes of action. And let's start off with the first one, induced systemic resistance. All right, well, does that, what does that mean? Well. The microbes are working with the plant. They're living in and around the plant to help induce that, to kick in the immune system. Kind of similar to what we have in our immune system, fighting disease and infection. X19 wakes up that immune system and uh, charges it to where the plant is now prone to fight off and ward against diseases. Well, how does it do this? Well, one, again, inducing change within the plant is one aspect but the microbes themselves also act as a defense fighting mechanism with root colonization. What you'll see in red is the living plant tissue, the root tissue, and in green, you can see the microbes. 
whether it be within the, t- the root tissues, outside, in the rhizosphere, at the root cap. And if you look to the upper right in that circle, you see green in intense matter. That is where a root hair is being torn off. And the microbes are there, ready to help protect that wound against inf- the attack by infectious diseases. To take us a little bit more up close, we we'll talk more about root colonization. One of the aspects is it's a growing, living environment. As the roots grow and as they expand, the microbes grow and expand and continue that coverage where the roots are. And this is, again, another stain uh, program, which you see in green is the microbes. In red below it are the, the roots. And it forms what's called a root colonization sh- shield. It is one that is living outside of the roots where it, as it uh, goes around the root, as it encounters different disease pathogens, it helps protect against that infection. In fact, let's take a little bit closer look. You look on the left, you can see little dots swimming around fungal hyphae. Those are the X19 microbes. And these are living microbes. They are moving. They are living. They're encompassing. In fact, what's unique about this is that when the microbes encounter the fungal hyphae, it actually moves to surround it, to envelop it with a bioblocker action. It establishes a microbial wall of separation between the fungal hyphae and the root. So it helps, again, as a defense mechanism to prevent that transition of disease. So again, here's a unique product that not only helps in plant, the plant itself become a, a better fighter against plant disease, it works with the plant. It's a living organism that protects around the roots. And when it does encounter, it goes after the disease itself. Let's talk about biotransic W12. Let's shift gears a little bit, you know, for drought tolerance. When you look at the critical phases of development, we know that during the critical flowering and grain uh, filling stage, that's when water is desperately needed. You don't want to have that interruption. But yet, at the same time, you can have occurrences of dry spells, intermittent drought, that can have dramatic impact on yield potential. And like soybeans, one day without uh, the water is detrimental. In fact, you have 10 to 40% reduction during flowering and 20 to 30% during grain fill. As I said before, our biotrinic products are apply to seed treatments, but they're living organism. They continue to help with work with the plant for root, uh, root development, plant health and vigor throughout the life cycle of the plant itself. So what does biotrinic exactly do? Well, the microbes help to with root development, help them grow stronger, increase the, uh, not just size, but also the breadth of spread of the roots. The microbes themselves also with that bioblocker in what you saw in X19, this is now more of a biofilm, which increases the surface area, the intercept area for moisture in the soil. So when it's struggling, especially during drought, it's looking for every opportunity to draw moisture into the plant. It also helps increase that transference within the plant. Now let's look at M33, M34. And I know I'm going rather quickly, but we've got a lot to cover this morning. And again, it is an exciting time. Again, with M33, M34, again, living uh, microorganisms, a combination of two lab microbes. They help protect both with nutrient uptake, transformation, and during drought stress. They work directly with the roots. Again, that's where that zone of intake, that Initially, that movement of uh, the nutrients and the moisture into the plant, that's where it's coming from, from the roots. And that's where this has a lot of action. In fact, we've seen in R&D trials and field trials, a yield uplift of about four bushel per acre in 34. And we've saw with field trials that you'll see reported later, even more with the combination M33, M34. Also, when you look at 17 pounds of nitrogen, that's 17 pounds of nitrogen per acre. That's the absorption, that's the pull in from the microbes that would have otherwise gone underutilized. So it does help dramatically improve that investment you made in that fertilizer to help move that into the plant. But more specifically, you know, planting urea, the microbes help transform that to ammonia. That is the plant usable form, which then gets moved into the plant into that ammonium stable available form. It is that combination, again, the microbes working with the plant 
continuing to, to develop as the plant develops to continue to help improve both with nutrient uptake and moisture. You know, unlike some of the synthetic compounds that, you know, has a half-life and only completes a couple of different things, the microbes work with the plant continuously. And what you can do is it works to improve crop performance all season long. The important thing is that it helps plants start strong. So with emergence, early root development, stay strong. So continue to support for that plant, especially during uh, different stress environments. Helps move nutrients into the plants when they're most desperately needed and then finish stronger. We've seen during field trials that just a simple inclusion of a biotrinsic seed treatment has a dramatic impact, not just on the development of the plant throughout the life cycle of the plant or the growing season, but we're also seeing yield uplift. The increases in yield because that plant had a better environment in which to grow. It had a healthier uh, life. It had more vigorous life. That's what the biotrinsic line is all about helping to work with the plant to help maximize its performance potential. Well, that was fast. And again, I just wanted to talk about three of the products today. And we're going to transition over to Al Green and talk about some exciting news about the field trial program. Al? Well, Al is getting set up here. I just want to ask a question that's come in already. Um, uh, Leland asked, Seed stability number of days was based on 22 degrees Fahrenheit. How does seed stability change with warmer temperatures? Again, it, it's hard to speculate because you have to look at, you know, just how warm are you getting. Uh, in normal planting temperatures, during normal planting season, especially during spring, you're not going to see an influence. Cold temperatures are an impact. In the warmer temperatures, especially you get into an area, say in the fall, if you're planting early and you're getting into very extreme high heat uh, temperatures, that's when you may need to look at waiting a little bit. And I'm talking about uh, areas where you're about 100 to 110 degrees in the upper soil temps. You know, that's a harsh environment for anything to grow in, even the plant. Um, so again, I don't have data for you, but I would tell you that, you know, we are living, we've shown that even in all the you know, different environments in the field, and this is what's nice about it. In real world conditions, under normal planting conditions, we are seeing the benefits from biotrinsic products. So I can't say every single degree difference, but I can say in the field, in the farmer's hands, they're showing their benefits. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. My name's Al Green, as I mentioned, I have been with Indigo for about four years. My role in this company, one of my roles, is to oversee a new program that we developed last year where we are really testing the microbials in the real world and under farmer grower conditions. There, sorry. Oh, went the wrong way, of course. We'll learn the systems. I'm sorry, folks. There. Um, this program that we started in last spring, a year ago, about now, a little bit earlier, it, we call beta fields. Why? Because we're beta testing the products, new products before they come out to the growers in full commercial launch. The reason we do this is we want to and need to understand the performance of the products under those real world conditions. Just like that question was asking a moment ago. What happens when we go onto, onto farmer seed under various conditions uh, that you can encounter from the humid southeast to the extremely dry western corn belt? Um, we work with growers, and to do this, we work through retailers and with growers throughout the U.S. to implement trials with these products, our new products, under real world conditions under the grower's best practices and real practices to understand as many environments as we can, as many real world management uh, scenarios as we can. You know, as much as we'd like to uh, believe it, uh, we do get good data from our R&D team. You've seen great lab data and some early field data and uh, greenhouse data that Jim shared, but the reality of the, um, of the growers 
that the grower space is much more diverse than anything that any R&D team can really do. In fact, I've been in R&D previous to this role for over 30 years. And, and what I used to say is you really don't know what you have with a product till you have about a million acres of commercial growing uh, growers with it. Again, this program that we've developed called Beta Fields, and you can see on the map uh, the, the locations of growers that worked with us on Beta Fields this past year. The objective is to work with growers to understand all of those environments and understand the performance of the products. Last year, we had about 175 or 170 locations across 20 different states. And that was really encouraging to me because we really got started with it a bit late. Um, this year, I can tell you that we're already over 200 locations um, and, and growing very rapidly to understand, again, under grower conditions uh, and on top of the growers' best practices, how our products perform. An example of that is looking at X19 that Jim was just talking about, our biofungicide. In corn, we tested this product and, and we had growers test this product on top of their normal seed treatments. So when the biofungicide was added to the normal packages, uh, seed protection packages that growers were using, we still had a tremendous uplift. In this case with X19, we were able to get, uh, and we had uh, uh, some sh uh, first year shortages of product. So we were limited to about 14 locations across eight states that we had trials. And we were able to get about almost a five bushel average yield uplift with this product and an 86% win rate. And again, this is from a product that's designed, and as you saw earlier, to protect the seedlings in that early harsh environments where they're coming out of the ground. As you can see by the states that's listed at the bottom of this chart, we had a diverse from everything from the extremely droughted Kansas environment to the humid Southeast in Tennessee, or actually in the Southeast that this year, those conditions went from almost flooding to extremely drought and back again throughout the season to the Corn Belt, Illinois, Iowa, and, and et cetera. And you're seeing that with X19, getting that early start, seeing the um, how the performance helps that crop throughout the season ended up being in a, a, a winning position and benefiting those growers that tried it this year significantly. W12 that Jim talked about, again, with this, uh, with the trials we had with this, we had 42 locations across 12 states. You can see the, the results. Uh, and, and actually, I should back up. These are 42 locations where we got yield data back. In addition to those we have agronomists going out to these locations throughout the season. But as we all know, often during harvest, things get crazy and busy. And sometimes you don't get yield data back, or sometimes there's a late season hailstorm or something that wiped out trials. So again, really encouraged it for a first year product to test this across these 42 locations with, with growers on their fields. We saw a six and a half average bushel uh, per acre uplift and a win rate of more than 90%. And again, this is positioning the product across these states with growers like yourselves on top of their best practices. We didn't withhold nitrogen. We didn't um, induce a drought, a hold back irrigation or anything like that. It's on fields that are no-till. It's on fields that were uh, managed uh, conventionally. On, and, and again, benefits quite, significant benefits and a great win rate for this product. Finally, your last product which to, that Jim talked about was M33 and M34. Uh, for us, this is a little bit of a niche product or product to position specifically in some niches, where, as he mentioned, growers can benefit from both the, uh, the some of the drought tolerance, et cetera, that it conveys, but also from the new, uh, nutrient use efficiency that it, it conveys upon the plant and helps the plant with. We had 13 trials that reported yields on this this year. And with those, uh, they were spread across six states, again, very diverse states from the dry Kansas to New York state even and, and Nebraska and, and the Corn Belt. 
we saw almost an eight bushel per acre yield uplift and a 92% win rate with this product. Again, on growers fields like yourselves, and, and this is really what brings to heart that the products we're developing are being tested under the conditions and diverse conditions from, uh, I think I saw somebody ask about climate change. Well, we're testing them and developing recommendations for products that will fit the dr droughty conditions or the high temperature conditions and understanding how and helping farmers understand and farmers are helping us understand how to best position those products to maximize the profitability for the growers. As I mentioned earlier, three of our products here showed very consistent and, and good uplift and win rates with the growers on their beta fields trials. And then just a shameless plug for the program here at the end, um, we are more good growers who want to access uh, the cutting edge technologies. We have new products coming out to be tested this spring, and we want to work with growers like yourselves to help you and us understand how to use these products on your farms under the best scenarios. Um, you'll get the benefit. There'll be an indigo agronomist uh, assigned to each beta field, and they'll work with you throughout the season to learn from you, but also to, to check the fields and understand how they are, uh, the, new, the technologies are working on your fields, um, what kind of benefits you might see early season, mid season, late season, those things. Participation in this program is free. Um, you do get free product to use uh, for, the, for the beta field trial. Most of our trials range from, oh, 40 to 80 acres of treated product. Um, uh, sometimes they're smaller because that's what growers or retailers want to work on. But uh, we, I encourage you to contact us by just simply Google Indigo Beta Fields. That'll uh, direct you to a link that you can um, quickly sign up or sign in and and the agronomist who's closest to you that would be working with you can contact you and take it from there to see if beta if participating in beta fields is something you'd like or if you have questions about the products again you can go to our indigo site or to that site and and an agronomist will help you so I, that's all i've got right now at this point i'm going to hand it over to some more to to pr to share with you the uh on feet on the ground, feet in the field, results that he saw with his growers that he works with down in the Southeast. While PR is getting set up, I'll take a question that came in here that kind of relates to what you were just talking about, Al. Um, Jim is asking um, if there's a reason why you have not tested north of the South Dakota and Minnesota border. The simple reason was we don't have a sales and agronomist footprint. We go into about uh, the uh, second tier of counties in Southern Minnesota, but our company just hasn't expanded our sales and agronomist footprint that far north. So it'd be hard to manage those trials up there. Sure, thank you for that. So I'm P.R. Morris and um, no, it doesn't stand for public relations, but uh, I feel like that's a lot of what I do. But I'm an agronomist for the entire southeast. I live in western Tennessee, and I've been at Indigo for five years. So what I want to show you is some pictures and some stories from the field. This is in, um, I can't see my screen there, just a second. So this is um, over in East Tennessee. This was a field that we did. It's just east of Knoxville. It's non-irrigated, river bottom, silt loam, was conventional tillage. And unlike many of the areas in the southeast this past year, it had plenty of rain. And um, it seemed like every, every week or every 10 days that, that this area was getting some measurable rainfall. And that's a picture on the left from the field that I took. Uh, the picture of the stalks in the middle is X19 on the left. 
the product that Jim and Al spoke to, W12, and then the untreated check on the right. And then if you look down in the bottom right corner, you can see the yield uplift of X19 by itself was 14 bushel, and the W12 was four bushel. So even, even in, in adequate rainfall and those growing conditions that corn really likes with plenty of sunshine, plenty of heat, and plenty of rain, we still had an uplift by adding the beneficial microbes to that um, existing seed treatment. This is an area in North Alabama. This is just west of Decatur, just south of the Tennessee River. And this is um, heavy red clay. It is very variable soils. This was non-irrigated, high fertility. They, they can grow some really good uh, yields in that area of the state, even in that type of ground. It was hot and dry throughout the entire growing season, but at planting, it was cool and wet. We didn't know if we were going to get the corn in the ground really and truly by uh, the second week of April, but we had a few days that we did, and then it stayed cool and wet all the way through um, 1st of May. And then it was just like the faucet turned off and water was no more. But as you can see on the left, um, well, the picture in the middle are some plants I pulled about V5 or V6. The X19 is on the left side of that picture with the untreated check on the right. And we're seeing a bigger root mass. We're seeing a bigger stalk diameter. We're also seeing that those plants treated with the X19 are at least a half, if not a full growing um, uh, uh, stage ahead. So the pictures of the ears, uh, you may look at that and say, boy, they, they, they both look awful. But the, the thing I want you to see is the consistency in the biotrinsic, that, that those ears are very, very consistent in the same length, the same size. Uh, in this field, we noticed that there was two more rounds per each ear, and they all had about the same length, as you can see, where it was very variable in the untreated. This is over in North Carolina, Beaufort County. It's, it's on the very far eastern part of the state. This was uh, non-irrigated. Uh, still some more of that, that redder type ground you can see there. This was one of the high spots in Beaufort County, if you know anything about North Carolina. But you can see the, the seedlings on the right there. And we just have a bigger root mass. We have, we have more root hairs. We have more seminal roots than the untreated in both of those products. And then there, we pulled these about the middle of July with these stalks and, and the ears there. And you can see that pollination was much better on the X-19 and the W-12 than the untreated check. So, again, we're reducing, we're reducing stress in those plants even that far out. But corn develops the ear early. Uh, V6 is when the rounds are developed on that cob. And then V10 is when the length of that cob is set. And then you just have to hope that you can pollinate the rest of that. This was down in Fayetteville, Tennessee, which is southern middle Tennessee, just close to the Alabama state line. And again, this was a strip trial we had with X19, W12, and the untreated check. And you can see those stalks on the far left. We're getting a bigger diameter. We're moving more xylem and flowing up and down that stalk and helping reduce those stresses. But Again, ear length is about the same on, on untreated and treated, but we are seeing more rounds around that ear than on the untreated. And then if you look down to the yield on the bottom right, you can see that the X19 had a five bushel uh, win, and then the W12 was about 14 bushel. This area, again, was... Rolling hills, um, this is an area that they do not have to do a whole lot of liming to adjust the pH because the limestone is literally coming out of the ground. It's that type of area. So it was hot. It was dry. I was one, I was back about June. I was wondering if we were even going to have a crop because it was, it was rolled up so bad and begging for rain. This is a field out of Iowa, one of our counterparts. Um, Adam Sibyl, the agronomist up in Iowa, did this plot over the summer, and this was a split planter. And what I just want to call your attention to is the variability of the entire field. You can see there um, that 
this product and the untreated were on every possible variable in that field. And if you look down at the yield, the I-229 was the test number for X19. And you can see that we had an 18 bushel increase across 16 acres compared to 17 acres that were uh, untreated. So we performed well in the entire aspects. It's not like we put the treated on the um, good area of the field and the untreated on the bad. It was a split planter, so they went across the entire field. This picture is a drone picture that I took in June in Arkansas, or it's actually Tennessee, but it's on the Arkansas side of the river. Um, it's a little area called Corona Island that was cut off from mainland Tennessee in 1876. So I went out to this field and you can see there on the left side of your screen that that area is untreated. He stopped about middle of the screen there, filled up, and put in the W12 and then continued planting the rest of the field. From the ground level, you could not see this much difference in treated and untreated, but you could tell that the plants were rolled up, they were begging for a rain, uh, just, just sitting there starving. And then I sent my drone up and I took this picture and it was eye opening that, holy crap, there's something going on here. So this is pictures of the ears that I pulled that uh, about a month later, and you can see that we've got a lot more um, consistency. We've got a lot more pollination in the treated as opposed to the untreated. But this is a yield map on the right. And the left side of that yield map is the untreated, and it yielded 88 and a half bushel. And then the treated was 117.95. So that was that 25 bushel uplift Al was talking about that we have seen out of this product. A little bit of history here is this family has been farming for the last 17 years and that field right here has been in soybeans for those 17 years. They used to do corn and cotton, they went strictly soybeans and this field went to corn for the first time in 17 years. So. We put this product on, this was the only field of corn he had, and then that was the, the yield difference. So we're really excited about W12 and all the products we have. This is another product that I'm very excited about. Um, this is the second year that I've had this kind of, uh, I guess, uh, yield and, and observations to be excited about. This is in Guntown, Mississippi. It's just north of Tupelo, so it's in that top area or that northern area in Mississippi. Low creek bottoms, so we get into some heavier clay soils. Not, not the full gumbo, but we're close to it there. But as you can see, the ears there on the left, and that's a huge difference. And then this is where I pulled those ears in that picture on the right. The, the row on the left is the treated. There were eight rows to the left that were treated. And here on the right are eight rows that were untreated to the right. And those two rows were 30 inches apart. There was nothing else different except for the M34, M3334. I was unable to get the data off of this field uh, because we had some issues with the, at harvest and we contaminated the uh, yield data. So I guess in closing, uh, why is biotrinsics good for you? Uh, the first thing is we have proven performance on millions of acres. We're increasing that plant health across many types of uh, yield areas and yield zones. It helps to protect your investment that you're already putting out there. We're, we're trying to make the best better because you're already doing, doing the best that you can do. So we're trying to make the best better is what we're doing. If you can use those nutrients and that water more efficiently, why not? If you can help minimize and um, mitigate that stress throughout the year. That's what these products are doing. They're helping you get an earlier start and a, building a better powerhouse to endure those stresses throughout the season. And then again, with the X-19, we're protecting from seedling diseases where you have a lot of those, as Jim mentioned, synthetics that kind of stay in that area that you put them in. But with this X-19, it is a living organism that grows along with the root and helps uh, protect and bioblock against those pathogens. Uh, they're sustainably sourced. So they're made right here in the U.S. from plants. We don't have to worry about supply issues or anything along those lines. 
And the other thing is it's very flexible to add to your existing processes. Multiple formulations to fit the need, the stressors that you're looking for, whatever those stressors are, whether that's heat, which is what we have a lot in the South, and I know other areas do too, but we have heat, humidity. Uh, sometimes it may rain, sometimes it may not. So we're trying to, to help mitigate those processes. And then the other thing is it can be applied at your retailer or it can be applied all the way up to the planter box as you're going out into the field. So it has a wide range of, of application. And then you're also looking at, we have, well, you're not tied into one product or another. So if you get a product and you, you, you swap crops because of the, the weather or, or whatever delays your planting, then you can easily swap to another product. And some of these can, can actually be used within other products. So Please, like Al said, get on our website if you're interested or talk to your retailer today and uh, we'll be happy to, to set you up or set your retailer up, whatever, whatever we can do to help you. And I think that's all I have. All right. So I will uh, start taking some of these questions that we've gotten in. We've gotten a good number. So, um, there's some questions about application. I'll start with Kyle's question. He says, can this product be used in furrow starter fertilizers? And have you studied if there's reduced effectiveness when used in furrow with insecticides or fungicides? Well, these products are formulated as seed treatments. Uh, so in furrow would be speculating because that's not a labeled application. Uh, what I can say is by treating on the seed, you're going to end up with thousands and thousands of microbes on each seed, which then as that seed starts to germinate, it's already growing. It's developing with the plant. Uh, so as far as info, they're not labeled for that use application at this time. Uh, but as a seed treatment, we're ex exceedingly happy with the results. Uh, following on your answer there, Jim, uh, they can be used with inferro. Uh, chemicals, whether they're fungicides, uh, micronutrient packages, starter fertilizers, and things like that. But not as a seed treatment, it's okay to put them on as a seed treatment and then apply those normal practices of uh, your in furrow treatments later. Uh, there's no interaction or, or issues there. All right. Um, I think you guys may have just answered this uh, in a way. Uh, so Paul is asking, what application technique gives the most consistent results? I'm going to leave that for PR. I think. Uh... Oh, um, we actually did a, a test uh, a few weeks ago. We were in Ames, Iowa. I said a few weeks ago, it's a couple of months now, but um, simply you can either put it into the box and as you put it on top of the box, the pro box or the, the pro bag, whatever you're using, and as you pull that, that to allow that seed into the hopper or the seed tender, it completely mixes. You'll see the powder coming out as, as it starts to fall out. And it doesn't look like it's going to mix very well, but it actually does. Um, so you can do that. You can do it in the pro box. You can do it on top of the tender as you're heading out to the field or again, you can simply fill up the planter and put it on top of the, the box just like you would your talc or graphite and, and take off. But this is not a replacement for your graphite or your talc. So we're, we're not replacing that. We are compatible with it and we're mixed with talc. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, there is a similar question that I think you probably just answered here, but I'll ask it so Galen can get this response directly. Can these biotrinsics be added in the planter box and do they contain graphite or talc? Yes, added to directly to the planter box. And yes, we do contain some talc, but again, it's not a replacement. Got it. All right. Uh, there were two questions about how the products affect the beneficial fungi in the soil. So if one of or more of you want to speak to that? I can. If, and, and this, when you talk about living microbes that are in the soil, the one thing that you have to concern yourself, not so much whether or not your microbe is going to go out and do something, because are the biotrinsic seed treatments live in and around the plant, the plant root ecosystem. 
So we're not going out into the soil and changing the soil environment. The other aspect is that it's not competing directly against the help change and work with the plant and changing its biochemical and biophysical uh, processes to induce them to be better at root up, you know, uptake of moisture and nutrients, uh, plant health. So it's not in that direct competition realm that you would see in the typical microbes. All right, um, and then Leland asks, how long are these microbes viable after entry into the soil? So I think the answer there, they're in the soil, but these microbes are also in the plants. And uh, the evidence we have is they're, they're benefiting the plants all season long. Uh, we see uh, larger shoots and roots often very early in the season. And of course, that can have some effects on, as you saw, ear size and, and things like that. But we also see benefits later in the season at reproduction. Uh, off, we've seen conditions. I remember a uh, situation in Western Kansas where you could see very clearly what I call the cadaver gray condition of the untreated part where they're not getting enough water uh, compared to a vibrant, uh, uh, vigorous green uh, of the treated part of the field side by side. So, so we have evidence that they're, they're benefiting the crops all, all season long and, and viable there. Um, sort of related to that, Gary's asking if you have data that shows the product increases nutrient efficiency and what would that would look like and what you found. So, so in corn, we have uh, data from our laboratory and greenhouse and, and uh, research team data is what I should call it, showing uh, increased uptake and mobility of the nitrogen as uh, Jim was pointing out. Um, because that amount of nitrogen replacement is not, um, I'm gonna call it a, a commercially significant amount cost-wise for growers, we do not recommend reducing nitrogen usage, uh, but we are seeing a benefit in the nutrient uptake and it goes beyond nitrogen. We see some benefits in other uh, important nutrients for the plants as well. Uh, whether it's due exactly to the to the root structure and, and uptake, uh, uh, what I want to say, mining of the soil, uh, or if it's due to the M34 mobility of those nutrients and that kind of stuff, exactly. We're seeing it in the plants as well. Okay. Um, Maria asks, do you carry out soil analysis and evaluation of soil pathogen presence? So I, I think she's probably referring to the X19 trials, uh, the biofungicide trials. And in the R and D, at the R and D stage, we did that everywhere. They, in fact, the trials, many of the trials are done where they're both um, um, or I say inoculating plots to make sure that there's a, a important presence of the diseases that we're targeting, but in addition, doing the uh, the analysis. Uh, of the soils, et cetera. In our beta field trials, it's a little bit harder to do that. We have some locations where uh, either vis visually or through uh, um, soil samples, they have uh, uh, quant not quantified, identified and quantified the presence of the pathogens in those. But that's not something we do on every field at this point, uh, just because of the complexity of getting that done. And and often the um, what do I want to say? Most many of these diseases have been shown by researchers long before us, university researchers long before us, to be present basically in every field, um, and, and therefore just the conditions of the current year and the previous year really decide influence whether the disease shows up or not. And there's all, I'll just add that there's a lot of factors. In fact, if you look at a number of uh, universities for corn, they're recommending a, a fungicide seed treatment regardless. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're planting time. It doesn't, there's a number of key states. For soybean, early season, they're definitely recommending a fungicide seed treatment. Later season, then it gets into what are the soil temperature, what are the conditions. Uh, but you also have to look at crop rotation. You look at residue level. 
and the source of the uh, micro of the pathogens that may be present. This is one of the aspects that just a simple seed treatment gives you that assurance that that soil, that encounter, your that plant is ready for it. Um, and then Leland asked related, has any research been done comparing these bio treatments on seeds treated with neonics versus seeds without neonics? Well, one of them that you'll see, the M33, M34, if you look at the uh, seed treatments of which we've already tested against, one of them is a neonic. And so, yes, there has been testing against neonics. We also have to look at neonics are mainly nitroguanidine compounds uh, that they are going to be systemic. They're going to be in the plant. Our microbes are working with the plant root, that living mycorrhizae. They work in harmony. Uh, I know so there was another question, are we distracting or do we can we live in harmony with the existing microbes? We do. We work with the plant. Those induced changes also induce changes within the plant. So it's not the microbe going up within the plant to make all these changes happen. It's working with the plant for it changes its physiology, its biochemistry in response to the uh, benefits coming from the microbes. So have we tested every neonic? No. Have we been on fields? And as you saw with Al representing on the beta field testing, we're going out over the top of the existing treatments. And it doesn't matter if it's a seed treatment or late season foliar treatment. That's with a neonic. We have shown that the microbes have shown to have beneficial impact throughout the crop uh, cycle and including yield. Got it. Uh, and then Michael asks, could we use 3334 on corn and soybeans? So that specific product is labeled for corn. However, we have a product that is called M34, which is the portion of the corn product that uh, uh, helps with drought, but also helps with the nutrient use efficiency is our most popular product on soybeans. And that's available either as uh, the individual product M34 alone, or also as a product that uh, in combination with a uh, rhizobia uh, soil inoculum. And uh, in-house, we call that product the triple threat because uh, it, it, that name's caught on with growers. Uh, the official name is just M34, N13, E13. But uh, it, it's been our most, uh, probably our most popular product in soybeans for sure. All right. Um, related to drought, what do the microbes do when a farmer is experiencing drought conditions? So depending on which microbe you're, you're using, there's two things that directly influence their ability to withstand drought. Three things. One is uh, the root growth and root size and number of root hairs. We very consistently see those early season and late season differences. I think you saw pictures of the root balls so that they're able to uh, encounter more water in the soil. The second thing is uh, some of the products also um, uh, enhance the uh, mobility of or the movement is what I want to say of water up through the plant. So, so it's, uh, and then the third thing is uh, it, not only the length and the size and mining the soil, but the uh, diameter of the roots and the number of roots that get uh, are like having more pipelines. So usually when you have drought, you have a lot higher evapotranspiration demand on the crop. And sometimes you see corn rolling, even though the soil is uh, somewhat uh, moist. And that's from the conditions where there's just not enough uh, root structure and uh, pipes, xylem in the plant to transport that water. We, with our products, we see that that is, is greatly reduced. That kind of effect is greatly reduced, meaning that there's more pipes to deliver water to keep the plant cooler and keep photosynthesis going throughout those droughty and, and high evapotranspiration uh, type days. And Ted, uh, there's uh, two other aspects to also consider. Uh, one, the microbes themselves are living in for that biofilm uh, around the root hairs. So that's also increasing the interception zone and pulling water into the plant and bringing it to the root. Uh, the other aspect is there are, during some of those drought phases, especially some of the nutrients that are reduced as far as their flow into the plant and their movement within the plant. Uh, depending on the product, we've shown that 
there is that continued flow of nutrients like MPK into the plant to keep it developing even during the drought phase. So it's not just moisture, it's also nutrients that are limiting factors during the drought. Got it. Um, and then Jim asks if you could repeat the site mentioned to sign up to test the product. So that so that's great. Uh, by the way, already three people from this webinar have signed up today, and I greatly appreciate you guys that have done that. If you just Google Indigo Beta Fields, the first thing that pops up, I believe, will be the link to where you can sign up and, and get more information. Again, Indigo Beta Fields is the program where we do the testing with the farmers. Got it. And I will drop that link in the chat here in just a moment. Um, and then another question, are there any compatibility issues or restrictions when treating over existing seed treatments? Again, none that we've been able to detect so far. Uh, our R&D group, our formulation team takes a number of the key uh, seed treatment uh, bundles or solutions and go over the top of that seed with our product. Uh, some of ours are mixed in solution with some of those existing products to show that we have compatibility. Uh, so can I say with every single one, we haven't tested all of them, but to date, we have not found anything that's incompatible. All right. Uh, we still have a couple minutes here, so if anyone has any last-minute questions, be sure to get those submitted in the chat box here. Um, while we're giving people one last chance to submit their questions, do you uh, have any final thoughts? I'll ask the three of you uh, just to share a final thought or two. I'll start. Think about it this way. We're now we're talking about a seed treatment that has season long effects on the plant. That simple addition of that microbe or combination of microbes works with the plant to help develop better from the start, throughout the season, and at the end, even help improve yield performance. So we're seeing the benefit of microbes all season long. And again, it's just from that one simple addition, as PR said, making the best even better. You're managing your crops and your fields the best that you know how, the right uh, tillage, the right fertility, the right seed genetics, the right pest management structure. We're showing that on top of that, we can still show improvements and benefits. I'll go next. Uh, coming into this role after a long career in, in r and I come from a skeptical point of view. And it's like, how can a little bit of powder, a little bit of seed treatment early in the season. But really, uh, in the past two years where we've done the, the field in-field testing with growers, and we see time after time and the high um, success rates that growers are having with our products has taken that skepticism away. The products do benefit growers and uh, are, are beneficial, and they're working out there. So, um, and, and it's growers proving it to us as opposed to our R&D team trying to prove it to, to growers. And, and that just erased the skepticism uh, of the product performance. And again, I'm going to say thanks to all those who are signing up for beta fields. <laughs> I guess I'll finish. Um, I'm kind of like Al. When I came here, I was a little skeptical of, of how those microbes could, could work. And the mentality we had at that time was we truly went after that stress acre. Uh, that dry land area that that we knew was going to to have trouble with heat and water and then we finally realized that these microbes can be beneficial even in the quote unquote perfect scenario so you're still getting the benefit out of that and, and instead of trying to pinpoint just one certain type of stress acre now we're we're broad spectrum because we're seeing the benefit as, as you've seen throughout this presentation, across multiple states, across multiple yield environments, and we're still seeing benefit from those microbes. That's great. Me, um, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I see a couple more questions have come in. Uh, should we go ahead? I'll, I'll go ahead. There's two All from right. Mr. Uh, from an anonymous attendee. They're very similar. 
Yes, let's start with those. Um, so the first part of these two questions, the seed treatment should be mixed with a larger volume seed treatment and applied, and it cannot be applied by itself. Is that correct? So uh, it's we have done, we go on top of growers' best practices. And when we're talking cornfields, quite often uh, the seed comes pre-treated. Uh, because it's coming from the manufacturers, uh, the, the seed companies that way. Um, therefore, our testing is on top of that. Now, we have worked it with some regenerative growers that are getting untreated seed. And uh, again, it can go on that way as well. It's, it's more a, uh, a local management decision of how they want to proceed in their fields. And I'll say during our R&D process, the when we put the seed in the ground, that's untreated seed is our comparison. So we are looking at, you know, putting just our product alone on the seed and looking at the benefits. Okay. And then talking about testing, the question is when doing your 2022 beta on farm testing, how many side-by-side -side replications per field are used on average? So on average, it's, it's many, many, because what we have a combination. Some growers decide to do a split field like PR showed, and there's a, that's really the minority of growers. Most growers split the planter and plant the left hand and the right hand treated and untreated. And in that case, you get every pass through the field is another replication, if you will, of the uh, across a different part of the field, a different soil type or slope or moisture or whatever. So uh, our yield data from those is the machine data across the entire field. And, and that's lots of replications, as you can imagine, with all the data that machines bring in. For sure. Uh, so Jim asks, do these seed applied microbes play well with other seed applied microbes on the market today? And that's a good question. Again, I don't want to speculate uh, because we haven't tested against all the different microbes. There are some microbes out there that specifically talk about a uh, direct toxic uh, effect on, say, nematodes or other uh, pathogens. Uh, so I don't want to speculate how that you know, interplay would uh, work with our microbes. Uh, I can say that I would expect, uh, and this is speculation, that I'm sure somewhere out in the fields and they're in a beta field that there have been some other microbes uh, used. Uh, and again, we're not seeing any impact, but I can't say for sure because I don't know. Uh, there is a question also, you can be used along with mycorrhizal seed treatments. Uh, in fact, one of the products that uh, PR and Al talked about is the one that has the Brady rhizomium in combination. Uh, so yes, in the soybean product that we have, we have a product already out in the marketplace where our microbes are working in conjunction with. Sounds good. Um, and then the last question we have here is, what about permanent crops like alfalfa and grass? Could you use these uh, products with those? So currently we have uh, labels for cover crops. Um, again, it helps them get established and you see uh, uh, more vigorous growth. You can get more biomass off those crops if you're choosing to, to uh, graze and that but uh, in terms of a permanent crop, other than establishment, we have not looked into and done the research to look at multi-year effects in a, in, a, in a perennial crop. Okay. Um, and then two more questions just came in here. Uh, the first, can I mix this with another dry seed, primarily talc and apply? I'm gonna let PR, can you address that one? That's right up your alley. I'll take that one. Yes, um, we're, we're not a replacement for your talc. So yes, if, if you're using talc, please continue to use talc uh, and, and our, ours will mix right with it. It's a, half a, it. it's a half an ounce per hundred weight is what it comes out to on most of our products. All right, and then our final question here, Gary's asking if these products are organic. Unfortunately, none of our products today are organic certified. Uh, we have uh, 
made an effort now to begin working on getting those. But as of today, none of our products, none of our products that are available are certified organic. Got it. Thank you. Um, and since we're right about at the time here, I just want to thank Jim, PR, and Al for joining us today, and to everyone in the audience who asked questions. Um, as a reminder, today's presentation and audio will be made available on the No-Till Farmer website. If you'd like to review what we talked about today or show it to anyone on your farm crew, your neighbors, or anyone else, you'll receive an email within 48 hours of the recorded presentation with a link to watch that. So be sure to check your email for that. So on behalf of Jim, PR, Al, Indigo, and No-Till Farmer, thank you everyone for joining us for today's digital demo and please feel free to reach out to let me know what you thought of the live event and if there's any topics you'd like to see us cover in future webinars. So thank you again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.